Okay, here we are. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this afternoon's talk by Sheena O'Connell. Sheena is the CTO of Musi and is also one of the main organizers of this conference. And today she'll be talking to us about how to use the Redux JavaScript library with a Django REST framework. And take it away, Sheena. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I am here to tell you about uh, what I think is like a match made in heaven. You see that? Yeah. Um, so I really, really like Redux and I really like DRF as well uh, for lots of different reasons. So like I'm talking this, uh, to you about this because I have personally found this, com this combination of tools to be really useful over and over again. So whenever I want to build a full stack application um, where I have a back end that exposes APIs and a front end that is like modern, then um, or it uses modern tooling, then I will reach for the stack. And so I've taken um, some of the, the tricks that I use and I put them into a package that you guys can have if you want. Um, and I'm gonna basically demonstrate how I use it and how it might be useful to you as well. Um, yeah. So before I get into the nuts and bolts of things, I just want to touch on all of the different um, base components of this thing. So um, I was going to look for a picture of Will Smith in underpants, but I thought that would be inappropriate. So I'm just going to tell you what Django is. Um, it is, it's a web framework. Um, it is a workhorse. It is not the new kid on the block. It's been around for a while. Um, and it is a web framework for perfectionists with deadlines, which is um, which is true. Like you can build some very, very robust things with it very quickly. Um, and that's, that's awesome. Um, it's opinionated, like highly opinionated. And that kind of gets annoying a little bit of the time, I think, because, you know, we build stuff. We're creative folk. Like color coloring inside the box can be a little bit... Um, like not the most fun, um, but what's cool about the fact that it's opinionated is that it gives you a very, very scalable team. So if I'm working on a Django project and I hire a Django developer, then that Django developer knows their way around just automatically, which is really, really cool. Um, if I was working on some like cool new like micro framework, I couldn't do that. If I hired somebody who knew the micro framework backwards, they'd still like need to learn the ins and outs of my code base before they can get productive. So I think that that's like quite an awesome thing. And then um, the other thing that's awesome about it is that um, those the opinions that are built into the framework are very, very well informed opinions. So um, at a Muzi, basically we're, we train people. We, we try and make people, we take like geeklings and we turn them into professional junior geeks of different flavors. So I really like Django because if I put a junior coder on it, they learn a lot about what good solid web dev can look like. Uh, yeah, so that's Django. Um, next up is DRF, Django REST framework. So this is something that you can bolt onto Django and it's basically the quickest way that you can make REST APIs. Um, and it's cool because it makes it very, very easy to expose data from the ORM or from other sources, but generally like I, I just plug into the ORM. Um, it has some very, very nice features like the web browsable API, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, and it's got very solid authentication and authorization out the box as well, because you know how Django comes with batteries included. Um, generally, I actually find the authentication stuff a little bit to be um, like insufficient. So I'll add um, something like Guardian for object level permissions and something like DJ REST auth for um, better endpoints around authentication. And I'll show you a little bit of that, of that as well later on. And something else that's very cool about it is that under the hood, it's just function based views. So it's incredibly flexible. So, oh yeah, and it saved my freaking life. Like it really, it, it might have actually. So um, Adam Muzzi, um, we used to be an on-premises training provider um, and then COVID happened and we had to become an off-premises training provider really, really quickly. And um, so we had to take everything that we were doing in person and turn it into a web thing, which was like challenging, like it was very challenging. Um, and very stressful. And um, I think the fact that Django and DRF really let you work like damn fast. Um, I don't know how possible it would have been to succeed without tools like these. There might be equivalent tools somewhere out there, but like, yeah, I'm such a fan, such a fan. So <laughs> highly recommend these tools if you have a deadline. Um, yeah, so demo time. Um, 
This is the Django REST Framework Browsable API. And uh, let me just zoom in a little bit. Um, so I made an application um, just to demonstrate the stuff. It's a to-do list app. And there's a thing um, in web development where like everybody makes to-do list apps to demonstrate stuff. And whenever you make a to-do list app, a puppy dies. So uh, yeah, I'm sorry, um, but this is what we got. Um, so yeah, so this browsable API is something that you get for free and you can poke around and interact with the actual data as it would be returned from your API endpoints, which is pretty cool. Um, and I can even generate API requests from here, like uh, the nice to puppies suite, and I can post that and I can go back here and now it's in my result list, which is fantastic. Um, so if you were to build something more complicated with a bunch of API endpoints, then this becomes very, very useful because um, maybe you're working with a front end dev who doesn't speak Django and who, you just want to like get them to, to know what's up. So yeah, um, this is very, very useful. Um, sweet. So that's the first part of the demo. Um, now, generally, um, REST framework or like, yeah, there, there could be like a million different reasons to use Django REST framework. I mean, exposing APIs is just useful in life and um, that's cool. Um, but I'm gonna be focusing on front end use cases. So um, often what happens is um, that you'll expose your APIs via REST framework and then you'll um, use them on some modern front end tooling. So there's Vue, there's Angular, there's React, these are the big three. There's actually a whole lot more um, that you have to choose from. So um, like I suppose an argument against doing that would be like Django can do front end work and it can. It's just that it's not as powerful as these things. So if you like, if you just want to like get something out there, that's cool. You can use the Django um, front end view things, but if you want modern tooling, then you're going to have to use the right tool for the job. So yeah, so that's that. Um, now, no matter what front end you're using, um, you probably want to do some pretty common tasks. So CRUD and friends. So you want to be able to create, read, update, and delete your list items or whatever you're working with, and maybe take on take some other actions on them. Um, you would want to be able to fetch data at the right time and not the wrong time. You probably want to debounce stuff. So like if you've got, um, I don't know, like if you're deleting something, you don't want to delete it twice, you want to delete it once and be done with that now. Um, then there's stuff like maintaining a store of application data. So if you're doing a to-do list item, then your front end needs to know about all the items. And if you change something or delete something, then your front end needs to know, okay, cool, I need to display this differently or I need to stop displaying that thing. So it can get a little bit um, scrambly. Um, you also need to be able to do things like monitor API call states. And this is sometimes just about um, giving the user a good experience. So while the thing is loading, maybe you want to show like a spinning donut to, to tell that it's loading. Um, and then, you also maybe want to trigger some side effects based on, on API call success and failure. So maybe you want to say, oh, we succeeded, so let's redirect, or oh, we failed, so let's display a message explaining this to the user. So like none of this is novel. This is all like really standard stuff that you would find people implementing again and again and again in different applications. Um, and that's kind of lame that they have to do it over and over again. Um, so the, the thing is that all of this stuff speaks to the necessity of maintaining state, um, application state, in a sensible way. And like the main problem is that like all of these different things have their own way of maintaining state. So React has used state, and I've only heard of Nuxt like last week when I was making the slide. And I think that's yeah, like it, it's weird. There's like so much to choose from, and every single framework has its own kind of um, convention and opinion and like built-in stuff. So um, if you were to like implement a view application, you probably need to implement all of these all of these tricks like over there now. And then the next time, maybe you want to add like build a build a um, React application. Now you need to re-implement the stuff over there using new state. Um, it's less than ideal. Um, yeah. So 
and like this isn't even the whole story because um, I'm sure a lot of people here have heard about JavaScript fatigue. It's a thing. There aren't just three frameworks. There are a lot of frameworks and the modern web just keeps getting more modern, you guys. So it's um, like this problem just seems to compound. And if you're just sticking to one framework forever, then whatever, that's cool. You can you do your best. Um, but there are situations where a company or individual would want to be able to switch at different times. So maybe you have multiple clients and one of your clients, you're like implementing a cool thing in Vue and then you're like, hey, React will work really well over here for another client. You don't want to have to like reinvent the wheel on every single framework. Um, ideally, you would have one wheel. Um, so um, what I'm kind of meaning is something like this. So um, the back, so if you think about the full stack application, we've got a back end and there's all sorts of clever stuff happening over here. And then we expose some, some, some APIs using DRF. And then, um, then that those APIs are consumed by this like information layer on the view where it's like all of the APIs happen, all of the state happens um, and everything often gets tangled into a big giant ball of sticky tape. And then the view like takes that sticky tape and it um, interprets it and turns it into something that people can look at. And that's like, how things often end up being like making this part scalable is kind of hard um so i'd suggest doing something a little bit like this instead and this is how i do it so i have a layer of api state management and that just deals with apis and entities returned from the api um, and then um, all the other like state management can still happen so for example if i'm using react um then i might use like use state over here just to say like is the modal open or not but then i'll still make make use of um make make use of api endpoints in a completely different way um so yeah so now you have the stuff being much more scalable yeah um so how do I do this? I do it with Redux. Um, I really like Redux. A lot of people don't, but I really do. Um, I have a suspicion that a lot of people who don't like it uh, might be using it for maybe the wrong thing. Um, so Redux is basically a state management library. It is little and it is strong. So I say it's little because it really is quite a small thing. Like the code base is tiny. Um, and I say strong because it, it's like, it's very powerful. You can build some like very, big and performant apps if you using Redux as, as your store. Um, so I think that maybe when people dislike it, it's it's kind of like if you if you're trying to knock in a hammer with a sledgehammer, uh, knock in a nail with a sledgehammer, you're probably gonna have a bad time. Even though Redux is a small library, it's kind of like a sledgehammer. It, like it's very good at big, big problems. It's not really that great at small problems. Um, yeah. So one of the things that's really cool about it is that it can run anywhere that JavaScript can run. So if you're so like any of those frameworks I spoke about, it can it can deal with that. If you're writing an Electron app or a um, I know React Native app, I think probably Ionic definitely. Like you can get this thing to run all over the place, and it just basically works. Um, it's commonly associated with React, but it's actually not. A, associated with React, like it's a, it's a completely separate thing made by the same people. So this is relevant because if you Google Redux tutorials, chances are you'll come up with a bunch of React plus Redux tutorials and chances are half those tutorials are like outdated and the rest are just terrible. And maybe there's a small fraction that actually are good, but like, yeah, like people, uh, there's like a learning curve to Redux, but I think it's possibly because people are reading the wrong tutorials. Um, the official docs are fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, it doesn't stop you from using another state management tool in parallel. Um, so I mentioned that with the with the React example just now. Um, and yeah, so how does it work? Um, under the hood, it implements a thing called the flux pattern. So this pattern was popularized by Facebook. Um, because their front end is ridiculously complicated. Like there's so much going on there and they were really struggling with their state management, like turning into a giant ball of spaghetti. And um, so they kind of came up with a different way of doing things that worked for them and uh, shared it out. So um, I'll explain all the different pieces of this. So on the left here, is it your left? Or... <sighs> Everything's backwards on StreamYard, it's weird. This one, the green one, it is, <laughs> this is the view. Um, and the view does the same thing as it does in um, 
other situations. So the view is a pretty face. It, um, it is the user interface generally. Um, and the view is basically a representation of information and the information comes from the store. So the store is just like, here's the whole application state. And then the view draws the application state in a way that the user can understand. Um, the store is kept up to date by uh, basically by the dispatcher. So the dispatcher is, you can think of it as, as kind of like an air traffic controller. It controls the flow of actions into like changes in the store. So an action is um, a, an object and it gets created by the view, perhaps like somebody clicks a button and then uh, an action gets dispatched, or maybe there's a API that does something and then an action gets dispatched. The actions get fed into the dispatcher and the dispatcher will crunch through them and make sure that the store like adapts as it should. And then the view adapts as, as a result of that. So this is all sounding very, very theoretical. So I'm gonna just like jump into a little example. Um, yeah, so let's say you wanted to do some home automation uh, because it's cool and you want to use Redux to keep track of the state of your house and so here's your store you've got like a couple of lights that you want to manage you've got an audio track and maybe it's maybe we yeah so so you want to know what's playing and is it actually playing and you have a disco ball because it's your house and you can have a disco ball if you want a disco ball um now let's say we want to change something in that state you would dispatch an action in order to do that. So here we're dispatching a play audio action and we're sending um, the value of this wonderful, wonderful video. Um, and as a result, the store is updating to look like this. So it might seem a little bit magic for now, but what's cool is that you get to, you personally, like as the developer, you get to decide what all the different action types are. So you can say, like play audio, maybe pause audio, maybe to have some like volume control stuff, whatever you want. And then you also get to decide how the, st how the store, how the state um, updates as a result of that action. So under the hood, like you generally just write a switch statement, which is pretty simple. You don't really get switch statements in, in Python, but um, like a giant if else, if else, if else. It says like, if it's play, if the action type is play audio, then treat the value like this, update the store like that. Um, another example is like, maybe you want to set the lighting of the kitchen to on, and then it just like sets the lighting of the kitchen to on. And again, like I wanted to show you an extra action because just to emphasize it, you have control over like all the different parts of the action. Every action has a type, but besides that, you can just put whatever you want in there. So long as it's like JSON, so long as it can be serialized, life is good. Cool. So um, what does that have to do with APIs? Um, so now this is a sample from an application, sort of. Um, so let's say you are hypothetically speaking, making a to-do list application. Um, maybe you want to be able to fetch a list of to-do list items. And so um, you wanna like look after the state um, for, that, for that fetch. And so here's, a, here's an object that could represent a single API call. So um, right now the API call is busy loading. We requested um, the, the list with a specific num with some specific arguments. We were like, yeah, the, the, the person is number one, two and um, we want the first page of to-do list items, great. Um, and since it's busy loading, we haven't got any response data and there isn't an error or anything like that. Um, so that would be like one API call. But let's say for example, we've got two pages of of list items that we want to display. So we probably want to have something like an array of API calls that you want to keep track of. And also you probably want to be able to keep track of multiple kinds of um, kinds of APIs. So like fetching stuff is one thing, maybe you also want to be able to update your to-do list items and that's cool. So as you can see, like if you want to maintain the state of multiple endpoints, if you have like a complicated application, uh, let's say you're trying to re-implement Trello, like there's a lot going on there and a lot that you'd want to keep track of. So yeah, um, and just an example of how this might be used. Let's say you are fetching a list of like all the to-do list items and you know that there are three pages because you the front end asked. Um, so you've got like three of three of these things going on in here. Then your front end can just say like, if if any one of these things says loading, then you should show a spinner, you know? So, so you can do that sort of thing. So you can have like fairly obvious logic branch out from this, which is cool. Um, 
So another demo. This demo makes me nervous because it's really weird to explain, um, but I'm going to do my best. And um, yeah, please ask questions if I'm not clear. Um, yeah, so here is the to-do list. And you can see that um, it's the same to-do list that we had on available in the um, from the REST APIs um, from the in the browsable interface. Um, oh, before I go into too much detail here, I just want to let you know that this whole application is available to you. Like you can download the full stack and you can also be nice to puppies, um, which is great. I'm just going to press F12 here and open up some dev tools. Um, and I'm going to keep an eye on the network. So I just want to show you that like, as I make changes to these things, it's a, I tick a couple of things off. I'm, I'm finished with everything, but I forgot to do that. OK, I'm done with that. And um, I don't know, um, when that life. Cool. So every time I make a change here, an API and my call happens, um, and that's that's pretty pretty cool. Um, what's really happening is that the API call happens, and then when I get a success message, then the front end um, updates, and that's kind of that's kind of nice. Um, if I go over here, then I have access to this crazy looking thing. So these are the Redux Dev Tools. Um, it's just a plugin that you can install. There's a link to this at the end um, of the of the presentation. Um, yeah, so what I can do is I can take a look at what the state looks like at any point in time. So I hope this is big enough that you can see. Yeah, all right, so this is the state. This is the whole state tree of this entire application. And you can see that there's a whole lot of stuff in like block capital letters, like it's shouting at you. Um, those are all to do with API endpoints. And then there's this thing, the API entities. If I open this up and I take a look around, you can see that there's like three things here named to-do item. So these are my to-do items that are over there. And basically how this gets displayed is that I'm looping over this and just saying like for each of these, draw one of those. Um, it's really a map, um, but you can think of it as a for loop if you are unfamiliar with maps. And you can check that like um, only one of these things is done. It's that one. Um, and then these are not done. If I take another one off the and I go to the latest um, version of the state. Now two of them are done. So um, whenever I update um, the stall, this guy gets updated as well, because this is just observing the stall and re-rendering the parts that need to be re-rendered. Um, yeah, so the other thing that's really, really cool about this is that, um, so I'm just gonna like show you some, some uh, Redux flexing. Um, you can jump to different parts of, um, the application time. So you can time travel, basically. Like, I can go back to when this um, action got fired off, and I can say, like, oh, what was the state like at that point? What was the front end looking like at that point? And what was the state like, like at that point? What was the front end like at that point? And I can, like, really choose where, where I want to go. Um, so it's really nice for debugging. Um, yeah, so if you use Redux for more than just the APIs, you might actually end up using this because it's, it's very, very handy. Um, I'm just going to like show you a little bit more. Um, so right now, what I'm doing is I am trying to zoom in and succeeding. Um, this is the back end for this application. And I've just got a middleware that I can turn on <laughs> to make things uh, slower. So if I come back up here, I'm just going to refresh this. And you can see that it knows that it's loading. And I can add another thing here about, um, I don't know, um, complement StreamYard. StreamYard's quite cool. Um, but I can add that, and you can see that that's loading as well. Like this button was grayed out for a while. Um, and that's all coming from just like looking for things in the store that are loading. Um, let me turn this off again. I'm just going to do that. All right. So, uh, what else can I show you? All right. So, I'm going to refresh one more time. Everything's fast again. Um, so just by refreshing this page, there are actually four, um, four actions that get um, dispatched. So the first one is basically like not a lot is happening in this one. Um, you can look at the action itself. And basically, this one is saying, like, let's reserve some space and um, make this call if it hasn't already been made. Um, and then this one says, like, OK, cool, I'm actually 
going to trigger this event now. I'm going to fire off the API call. And then this one says like the API call has succeeded and it responded with all of the stuff. And then this one says add the stuff into the entity store. Um, so take the, the last result and add it to the entity store and name it to do item. And like all of this stuff comes from like configuration and then from like one, um, one function call in the end on, on the front end. Yeah, so that's like basically how it works. Um, I can show you some code in a little bit if you want. Uh, just like let me know in the questions. Otherwise, I will I will not. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a demo, and it's like quite a simple little application that I showed you there. It's like literally just CRUD. Um, I've done much more complicated things with it with success. Um, so it's got a bunch of different features. Um, so the Redux debugger, like I showed you that, um, that thing that we were time traveling with, that was quite cool. Um, it's, re it's easy to reason about form and form errors. So that's something I didn't demonstrate, but like one of the cool things about DRF is that if you make an error in like the information that you pass to an endpoint, the response comes back in a very, very consistent way. So it makes it very easy to say, um, to display errors on onto a form and say like, oh, you got the name wrong. You should be like at least this, this tall, whatever. Um, so that's very, very handy. Um, so you get to like make use of DRF's um, consistency quite nicely. Um, it also con converts casing from snake to camel and back and forth. So like, um, in, in Python, we use snake case, and that's wonderful. Um, often on JavaScript front ends, um, you'd be using camel case, and it's very annoying to have to remember what casing you're dealing with when you're like dealing with the API versus dealing with your, your like pure JavaScript code and things like that. So it's, it converts things so that um, people are using consistent naming conventions wherever they're working. Um, it integrates with DJ REST auth. Uh, so um, let me actually show you that to the demo. Um, so if I press F12 over here again, and I go back to Redux, um, I didn't talk about all of the different parts of the state. Um, so these are all to do with um, to-do list items, but these over here are all to do with logging in, logging out, and requesting password reset and, and all of that stuff. So like um, DJ REST auth gives you the stuff for free, and this tool set kind of makes the APIs very available and very monitorable for free. Um, and then you just need to draw the pictures and then it works. So that's very useful and like some navigation stuff. But yeah, that's that's basically that. Uh, all right, what else? Sweet, so I spoke about that. Um, there are some bad parts to this. Um, there always are. So Redux is weird and targets are weirder. So um, one of the downsides of, of the Flux architecture is that it doesn't actually have a tidy way of dealing with side effects. And Redux doesn't have a tidy way of dealing with side effects either. So as soon as you have asynchronous code, like um, you're making API calls, then you need some extra tools, some extra middleware in place to handle that stuff. So um, we're using APIs. So yeah, so we have to use this thing called, well, we don't have to use Saga, but Saga is the best one. And there is a learning curve there. Um, also, like learning how to use this application, this this tool set, I mean, it's it's like, it's a little unusual. Um, so there's a learning curve there as well. So if you were to just like, just use React forever, then you probably don't need something like this. Um, well, like this, this could benefit you, but you don't necessarily like you could do your own thing. Um, maybe you don't need something that has all of the same, all of the same stuff. Um, it's also a work in progress. So I use this in production, um, and I know its quirks, which is very, very useful, um, and I know where it's going, which is also very useful. Um, but it is a work in progress, and so it's not a hundred percent stable. But it's like it's good enough to use. Um, yeah. And there's a whole lot of stuff that's missing, which I like parts of it, I fully intend to implement in the near future because I need it. And parts of it is, is just like good ideas that maybe somebody would like to implement one day. Um, the one thing is knowledge of sockets. So one of the really, really cool things about Redux is that the actions are just JSON objects, which means that you can throw them over a wire and they, they go, like you can pass them over a network. So let's say that you've got like, a Trello board application, and you have multiple people interacting with the same the same card. Um, 
if somebody interacts with the card, I want my front end to know about it. And so um, we could get a socket connection from Django to the front end that just like pipes action straight to the dispatcher. And then that's like, that's just cool. Um, so I'd very much like to do that. Um, rehydration is a thing as well. So um, the fact that the entire application state is just a, a JSON object as well, um, it means that you can store it into the browser's like local storage or equivalent. And that means that when you boot up the application, like when you when you open that page again, it can potentially just like load up all that information into like right into the state from storage without necessarily having to make any API calls. So that's rehydration. Um, a two-step save could also be cool. So let's say I'm working on an application that needs to work offline. Um, if I hit the save button on my to-do list thing, then maybe I need to save it into my local storage check if there's a network available, then sync it up. Um, and if there's no network available, sync it up later. So this is actually something that I need to do. Um, so that'll happen sometime. Um, handling retries would also be good. Like if we can configure stuff around retries and just say like different API calls have different strategies of retries, then that's cool. Um, yeah, so there's like a whole lot of stuff that needs to be done to, to make it better and probably probably more documentation. But like um, the, the repo that I've put all the stuff in has a full stack application in it that works, that has all the moving pieces like working together. So it's got this to-do list app application in there. So hopefully that is sufficient docs for a lot of people. Yeah. So um, last but not least, we have a whole lot of useful links that you might want if you want to try this thing out. The very last one on the list there is the frame is, is the tool set itself um, that does all the work. And you can scan that right now if you felt like it, and then you'd have my slides and you would have access to all of the things, but I'll probably share this in another way as well. And that is all I have to say. Great. Um, thank you very much, Sheena. That was very interesting. Um, Viewers, do we have any official questions? So far, we have some interest in seeing the code. Um, so if you can share a link to the, the code, I know that people will be keen to see it. Um, okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, sweet. Uh, yeah, so a link to the code is right over there. Um, yeah. Let's do this. So um, I can share this on the panel. Um, and cool. yeah, the whole example is in here as well. So there's the Django app, the database, and the front end, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, do you guys want to see the actual actual code? I I'm sure they would. Okay. Cool. Uh, sweet. So uh, go this way. Um, where am I? All right, so we have um, a backend, and this is ridiculously simple. Um, so we have a to-do list uh, model, and it's nothing you can see in my docs. I needed to make a joke probably about puppies. Um, this is basically how Django REST framework knows how to explain, how to display information. So I'm basically saying for the to-do list item, we want to expose the ID field, the name field, and the done field. Um, and yeah, so there's, there's a bunch of wiring there. Like the, um, yeah, the, the docs are pretty solid um, for Django REST framework. So the stuff should just like make sense if you read the docs. Um, the database is also very simple. It's um, like, I just made it so it's very quick to, to run it. So if you just say Docker compose up, then this thing automatically talks to this thing. And then if you run this, it's just like npm run start, then this thing automatically talks to the back end. So what's cool here is, um, okay, so this is all of the configuration for the APIs. And if I look in, inside here, there's just like all these little functions where it's just like, cool, I, I need to uh, be able to fetch a to-do list item instance by ID. And then we get a URL and we fetch some stuff and we return some stuff. Um, I also want to be able to create one of these whenever I want. Um, I also want to be able to delete one of these whenever I want. And so you just make the, all these like single use little um, 
little functions. Well, single use. You can use them as many times as you want, but they're like very simple. You just come up with the URL, figure out what data you need to send across and, and send it. Um, then over here is where you turn those things into these things called Redux applications or apps. Um, yeah, so you make this data structure and like there's a little bit of boilerplate, but not a, not a whole lot. You call this um, create Redux app thing and you just um, say, all right, I want this thing to be named to do item create. When I when I like open up my Redux, um, <laughs> question from Kim Van Lake. <laughs> yeah. So when I read, open up my Redux uh, dev tools, um, that is that is the, the name where I'll see the entire log for this thing. Um, here's the API caller, the thing that calls the API endpoint. And then I'm saying that um, the response is an like a to-do list item and the response is a list and then that will update the, the entity store appropriately. So now I've got all of these um, set up and like there is some boilerplate, like you just need to put this code here for now um, and then things work out. Then um, when it comes to the, fr the front end, I can call these things. So let me just find a place where I called it. All right, so, so here's a place where I'm like, all right, um, dispatching this action called um, API item list operations maybe start, and I'm not sending it any data. So when I say maybe start, I'm saying like, if this thing has already happened, don't do it again. Um, yeah, uh, so that's like, that's the basics of it. There's like a little bit of extra weird stuff going on here, just like framework specific stuff, because um, I'm using lit HTML. Um, but yeah, like different different applications or different front ends have different ways of wiring themselves to Redux. So uh, yeah, so I don't want to go into too much detail on the other stuff. But that's cool. basically it. Right, well. All right. Um, so I think there are, there haven't been any more questions. So unless someone starts typing this very second, I'm just going to play this. All right. Someone is typing. Someone is typing. Um, yeah, while they're typing, uh, in the meantime, we're having lightning talks after the break, and we still have room for a couple more. So if you're thinking about maybe giving a lightning talk, yes, just do it. Just do it. It'll be cool. Come on. Um, it would be cool. Um, yeah. I see Kim said something. I'll just respond to him. So he says, NPM in a Python, Python conference. Like, I think Python and JavaScript are best friends in when it comes to full stack web development. Like, they work so well together. Um, this, um, so this is just a way to give uh, REST, uh, Django REST framework extra, extra superpowers. Uh, so yes, it is JavaScript and yes, it is Redux and that's not mm, Python, but it, it makes Python like more useful in different circumstances. So, so that's basically why. Cool. Um, well, we can continue this discussion in the channel on Discord, um, but I think that's, that's it for this talk. Thank you very much again. And yeah, everyone, see you on Discord. Sweet. Cheers, Paul. Bye-bye.